Hi there, welcome back. Well, before going ahead with uh, restoring or repairing the radio section, I've uh, come across a bit of a, a little bit of a problem. So I've had to dismantle uh, the, the front panel a little bit earlier than I would have liked. But I'll explain why in a second. Just to let you know, to get this off, you remove the knobs, there are two screws in there. Remove them very carefully because sometimes this is very rusty, as it is here. So you've got to be very careful not put any force on the on the glass itself or it will break. Remove that and then you're sort of one step closer to the to the chassis. And I'll show you what the problem is. We've got a broken dial cord here for the AM. The FM seems intact. The pointer is over there. But um, I've got a bigger problem than that. I've got to turn this around to show you. Do you remember me saying that the clutch mechanism wasn't broken? Well, I was wrong. The actual clutch section that's stuck in the middle, which is sort of a hard rubber ring, is actually cracked. And what you do is you tighten that on there. That means that when you rotate this, this thing which should be rotating with the, uh, with the turn that you give it is completely loose. So it can't really catch on either the front or the back. And what I found was that the the dial string was very stuck in there, so I couldn't actually turn the FM uh, condenser. The AM I can do over here. You've got to be very careful because sometimes these guys do have high voltage on the plates. So this one doesn't. I've measured it. I just uh, turned it on without the tube still, just to give it a try. I put the tubes in because I wanted to try the uh, radio reception, but then I found that I couldn't move the FM tune it at all and that this one you have to move manually which is bloody dangerous but let me show you the FM one so to try and turn this manually it's very very stuck so you have to sort of help it and you can hear the scraping and the scraping is the remainder of that ring over there scraping on the clutch section of the FM uh, tuning mechanism so I can actually rotate it manually, not the best, but it'll do. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually restring both. I'd like to have both of the stringings work and I need to remove the string completely because I've got to remove this, this whole clutch thing. I've got to remove this whole thing here and try and sort something out for that. I don't really know what I'm going to put in here, but I'll find something. <laughs> Who knows, it might be bamboo again. That's not a bad idea, actually. It'll work. Anyway, <laughs> um, I've got to remove that whole thing. So I've got to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the front cover. You can actually remove the front cover. I've removed the lamps from the top there. There's one lamp uh, ground that's soldered on there. Then you remove these one, two, three, four screws. And that comes out and you get access to the front of the uh, AM condenser, tuning condenser. So we should be able to see what's happening there. It's also an opportunity to clean this a lot better than if you try to do it in place. So that's what I'll do next before I come back to you. You'll probably notice a little bit of a difference from the last shot. And that is that the um, cleaning has gone a lot further than I expected. When I took the front off, I noticed that everything was uh, pretty grungy. And uh, because I hate cleaning, I tend to do it in bits, as I've said before. So when I need to work on a section, I sort of clean it up. And I carry on cleaning till my enthusiasm runs out. And this time, I'm happy to say that uh, the enthusiasm actually lasted a lot longer than, than usual. So what I did is I managed to clean the entire front section, including the piano keys, which actually cleaned up quite well. So effectively, I've got that entire front cleaned and not just the front, but a little bit into the radio itself. Now, I'm going to clean it further because cleaning with the, the front uh, cover on is a lot more difficult than cleaning it like this. This is a breeze. So um, I'm going to do a bit more cleaning. And just for those of you who are like, like me, suckers for punishment, who've asked me how I clean it, well, guys, 
uh, <laughs> it's really boring. Uh, it's boring for me. But I will, I will give you a little bit of a snippet, just so that I don't get everybody else sleeping, um, as to how I go about cleaning this thing. And quite honestly, it's just slow work. It's millimeters at a time. Um, but I'll give you a quick, I'll give you a quick uh, demonstration with that. And of course, in these days, um, cleaning has taken on a different, a different aspect because I used to go crazy with isopropyl alcohol, and now I can't because, um, well, we don't have alcohol floating around anymore. And if I run out of the stuff I've got, I'm going to have problems renewing my stock. So I'll give you a little bit of a snippet, not much, because I really want to get on with um, removing that clutch. That entire section has to come off and uh, I need to fix that clutch mechanism somehow because I really want to get on with uh, hearing the radio proper, <laughs> hopefully. So let me just give you a quick demonstration of, uh, of a little bit of the cleaning that I do. So I use these brushes. These are pretty rough. This is uh, natural fiber. They're actually pretty rough and it's used, you can buy it from any artist supply shop or even a hardware store. They're pretty, pretty rough. And the reason I use that is because I use isopropyl alcohol, dip the brush in there and then start rubbing. And you rub it a little bit at a time and you can clean the brush on a piece of cloth just so that you don't mess up the alcohol too much because it will get dirty. I use a small part of the alcohol, just a little bit on, on this, uh, in this bottle, because it will get really grubby. And when that's too bad, I throw it out and put some more alcohol in. And as I said, at the moment, I'm using it a lot longer than I should, or usually would, because <laughs> we're running out of alcohol. Now, when I've got that done, I've got this, the magic chopstick. What I've done is I've rubbed, I've um, wrapped some cotton wool in there and you just rub it away. And there we go, right? And you carry on. When that gets too grubby, this is what I've done. I've got a chopstick and I've cut it down the middle. And I take some cotton wool, take a bit of cotton wool like that. And then what I usually do is I clip that in there. I pull the spring that I made of just normal wire, tighten it, and then I can wrap it. And it sort of holds. It's not as good as cotton swabs, but cotton swabs aren't very good for, for the environment. And in this case, I've done the cleaning of the surface. So I actually wet this in alcohol and I go through it again. Every surface that I can see, because I can't get to it all from here, I'll have to turn this around a few times, quite a few times. But that part is done. Now I've got to do that thing and I do exactly the same thing, but with more care because I've got some coil wires on there. And when you get to cases like this, you then do sometimes have to use a cotton swab, which I try to avoid. This thing is really fine in here. I don't want to damage anything. 
So I'll use as few cotton swabs as I can because um, I learned that uh, winding trick from a friend of mine who's actually a, a fine art restorer. She does, uh, you know, religious art restorations. She's done the roofs of some of the Madeiran chapels here, which are quite amazing. Whether you're religious or not, artistically, they are incredible. And uh, she's the one who taught me to wind cotton wool on a, actually it's sort of on a kebab stick, or like a long toothpick. But I prefer the one that actually clamps, I made that little clamp thing, because my cotton balls kept falling off. And nobody should have their balls falling off when they're doing their work. Folks, <laughs> that's about it. That's how you clean. And um, much to my wife's despair, I clean my radius a lot better than I'll clean the kitchen when she asks me to. So she doesn't ask me too often, fortunately. And there you go. It's, it's time consuming. It's done a little piece at a time. I don't believe in stripping these things and throwing them into a bucket of water. I know you can do that, um, but I prefer to do it like this. A lot of the age will show, obviously. You know, you've got chips of paint or chips of that, whatever that coating was there. There's no rust on here. If there was rust, I'd have to tackle it a different way. But that's how I go about cleaning everything. And, and then in the end, sometimes, sometimes, I go through with uh, uh, another brush and I actually wipe everything down with a layer of WD-40. Now that's cheating, I know, but what it does is it does protect a little bit against the, um, the elements and it gives it a really nice sheen. <laughs> everything looks incredibly nice when you've got WD-40 on it. Sort of a, a shiny, glossy look to your cleaning, which, as I said, is cheating. But uh, hey, <laughs> my radio, my rules. Um, so yeah, those of you who've asked, this is how I go about cleaning the radio. The uh, piano keys are actually almost a different story. With the piano keys, I again use isopropyl alcohol and the brush. And you would brush everything. Then when you're doing that key, for example, you'd push that one down and do the sides. And then you'd push that one down and do those sides and then do the front and leave the bottom to last, and then you'd go on and start with that one. And literally with, um, with time and quite a bit of rubbing, and especially using cotton swabs. Here I really do have to use cotton swabs because some of this, some of this grime is really ingrained. You, you dip this in isopropyl alcohol and you just keep rubbing away, and it will clean up. Um, as you can see, this thing I mean, obviously, the end, at the end, you need to give it a bit of a polish, but this, this, these keys are perfect. They are perfectly clean. There's no chips in them, and uh, the result is quite, quite amazing, as you can see. So, yeah, this is, this is how you sort of create little steps of, of progress as you go along with these things, uh, especially when dismantling that gear there is pretty daunting. So I find excuses to, um, to do other stuff that I dread less, but I have to carry on with it. No choice. Now, it looks like the way to take this thing out. I've had these out before on different radios, but not on this one. It looks like I have to unwind the, uh, the dial cord on the FM, unfortunately. I might be able to stick it with, uh, with tape so it doesn't sort of run loose everywhere. And then I have to unwind it off that spindle over there and then I believe the way to do this is to remove that little washer that e-washer over there and really play by ear see what happens see what comes loose I don't know if there's a simpler way of doing this I'm just going to keep trying till I get it right well that was actually easier than I thought this thing that's the order that it came out of and I like to keep things in order I know it sounds stupid, but um, it's a lot easier to go back and just fit things back in order than if you take everything out and forget about where everything goes. So this is it. That goes at the end there. This is the thing that goes in between those two. And as you can see, it's kaput. 
This thing is weird. This is like, what is this? It's like a hard rubber. So I'm going to have to replace that. There are sort of indents there, or rather extrusions there. It's a little bit rough. And that is so that it can actually catch on the inside edge of that, which is also rough. This is a gear after all. So it'll move back and catch the one at the back. It'll move forward and catch the one at the bottom. Now I'm thinking I might be able to repair this. I wonder if this isn't iron. It sort of looks like it. But the important thing is, I need to be able to tighten this screw over here. Because this is what, um, this needs to move inside the shaft so you get it in the right position. And then you tighten it like you would any other any other um, element on there. Like, uh, for example, when you tighten the tuning knobs. So this screw has to operate. And at the moment, it's the tightening of the screw that's cracked this whole thing. So I'm actually wondering if I can't make another hole somewhere else and re-thread this and fill this gap in here with um, epoxy or something. I'll have to think of that, about it. And let me think off camera. It's easier. Okay, many hours later. Many, many hours later. I tried to do something with this, and as you can see, it just broke. It's, uh, looks like it's lead. It's very, very brittle, and it just broke. So I had to find an alternative, and I needed something about the same thickness, about the same diameter, and with a hole in the middle that would allow the shaft to go through, and also with a hole on the side to allow a screw to go through so that I could tighten it on the, on the shaft. And this is where a 3D printer would have come in really, really, really handy, but I haven't got one. I haven't been able to justify it. <laughs> so uh, what I did was I looked around for something that was, you know, the right diameter plastic, because I wanted to cut out a, uh, a circular piece, drill a hole in the middle, drill a hole in the side, put that screw through, a screw through, and... I looked around and I realized that everything they mold in plastic is a lot thinner than this. And then I found something. I found a button. That thing there was a button from a big coat of my wife's. And I appropriated the button. I think I sort of promised her to buy her a new coat. I'm not sure. I'll see if she forgets about that. But the button was just the right uh, thickness. It was slightly too big in diameter. And the holes in the middle were four holes where the you know where you sew the um, where you sew the button onto your coat. So I made a hole through there. I um, made it a bigger than I needed to be. I filled it in with super glue and bicarb. I sanded it. I drilled a new hole in there, and then I had to get a hole down through the side there, which was quite a challenge. That hole there. I did that with a very small drill bit and I found a very small screw and this is plastic. It's hard but it's plastic nevertheless so it actually drilled quite easily. And then I put it in and the screw sort of made its own thread and it held. And then I decided to put in, you can't see it, but on that side there are sheets of uh, uh, wet and dry paper which I glued on there which will help to adhere to the, you know, to these things here. Because you, if you recall, that uh, shaft or that little element had some sort of pins sticking out to help adhere it on there. And then I put it in and then I couldn't move it because the diameter was too big. It was scraping down there. So I had to take it out, put it into a drill with a file, and I sort of ate away about half a, milli a millimeter of it. I had to do the same with the screw because otherwise the screw would hit. And I finally put it in. And obviously I cleaned everything, take advantage, take the, the opportunity of uh, cleaning everything you can when you've got space. And I cleaned it up, put it in, and I found something that I didn't expect. It's not the hole, or rather the, yeah, the hole in the middle and then the, um, the little hole going in is not exactly 
it's actually more the hole in the middle wasn't exactly um, perpendicular to the surface so it sort of wobbles a bit but as you can see it's actually turning the FM one quite well that's the FM one over there it's turning quite well and if I put AM it turns the AM one which is that one over there and it leaves the FM alone so yeah I think I think it's gonna work <laughs> I think it's gonna work it's working now it's actually tuning the FM when I do that the um, FM capacitors uh, turning and I managed to wind everything back the way it was so I've got the FM tuning and the dial string all in the right place I haven't put in the AM dial string because I've got to put a new one in there but for the purposes of testing which is really what I wanted to do in this video I wanted to see if we get any radio reception at all because um, this isn't a power amplifier this is supposed to be a radio I think I'm now ready to test it because I can tune the uh, condenser from the front here without risking a massive shock. So let me set everything up and we'll just switch it on and see if we get anything. All right, moment of truth. I've moved the uh, lamps away so we don't need get any shorts onto the chassis. The lamps won't go on because uh, it requires a soldered point here. There's a solder point on here, a little wire that you uh, soldered to that front plate which is chassis ground but never mind we should see this thing come on I've got a speaker connected to it I've got the two the three tubes in that uh, were necessary actually there's one that I removed ECC the ECC 83 I actually removed for cleaning so I better put that back in Okay, that's in. And I think I'm ready. I'm going to put on the dim bulb tester, one bulb only, and I'm going to hit one of those. Came on bright and now it's dimming. Volume on max. That would be long wave. Let's try me. Whoa, we got something. Got something, don't know what it is. That's long wave because I can hear a beacon. I've given it one more lamp. in that button that says uh, that selects between the external and internal antenna it's gone very noisy oh that's actually quite good that must have been the ferrite we had it on now we've got uh, the mini warp working Wave's getting something. There's medium wave. Brilliant. <laughs> Short wave. getting something as well. FM. Ah, 
<laughs> this is brilliant. I've changed no capacitors on the radio section. Sounds like crap, but it's there. Now I've only got 198 volts going in, so I'm going to give it more light bulbs to make this thing go closer to the line voltage and see what happens. No próximo domingo, em Matiné, realiza-se no São Luís uma das sensacionais ao Alguém já avisou e eu já corrigiram. Bloody hell! It's working. It's working as in we have reception on all bands. And um, that was the test I wanted to do because I now have to go and actually change capacitors in the in the radio section, in the RF section. But uh, I wanted just to see what uh, what we got just by putting it on like this. Um, this ECC83 is one that I put in because it had no ECC83. ECH81 was also one I put in. I knew those two were working. I wasn't sure about that one there, which is the EBF89, I think it is, yeah. Um, that thing's got a shield that you've got to solder on. At the moment, it's working without a shield. The ECC83 is working really without a shield as well because it's not fitting in properly there. But what I wanted to do is to make sure we had something to start off with. And that's always good because when you start off with some reception, then you follow through and you change one or two components and you test it again. One or two components, test it again. And that way, if, you, if it stops receiving, you know you've got something wrong. What you should be getting is it should be improving as you go along. It should be. It doesn't always happen. But um, at least you know what you're looking for. And uh, what we've got is basically the basis for um, yeah for the next for the next stage, which is going to be the uh, checking all the caps and checking the the circuits on the on the RF section. But now I know that the RF section doesn't need to to have any real troubleshooting done. It's really just improvements, and that's great because. You know, when you go through those, you got to check coils, uh, you got to check resistances, and you sometimes when you check a resistor, you've actually got a coil across it, so you you've got to desolder it. If you've got a fault, it's a real bummer when you're trying to fix a, an RF section. So I'm uh, I'm extremely pleased. I'm extremely pleased, and I think that's a good place to leave off for now, so that I can get cracking with what is it, stage three? I really did not accept expect this. To, uh, bloody drawback with uh, with that clutch. I was convinced it was fine, but now I know how to make one. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Every time you do something new, you've uh, added to the storage of, uh, of information. And I guess that really sums up what this channel is all about. It's more of a learning slash experiences channel for me because uh, I enjoy the hobby. I enjoy the restorations. I enjoy doing different things all the time. I enjoy discovering new things all the time. And my one objective is precisely to enjoy this kind of work, whether it be on a tube radio or an amplifier or anything really, a project. It's just something that I enjoy because it's a good mental exercise and it's fun for me. Now, I got a comment recently, which uh, was actually a bit of a rant about how slow these things are and how useless I am at uh, pinpointing faults. 
and that um, people aren't being taught how to find a fault quickly. Well, this is not a repair channel. This certainly is not a channel where you're looking at a clock and seeing how quickly you can solve a problem. Because if it was, and if this happened to be something I did for a living, I'd be the poorest tech in the world. First of all, I'm not a tech. I don't do this for a living. I do this for fun. And uh, I certainly know how to get to the, f the root of a problem a lot quicker than this if that's what I wanted to do. It's not what I want to do. So, sorry folks. If you're uh, looking for instructions on how to repair things efficiently, this is not the channel. For those who like this method or this pace, I thank you for your company. I uh, invite you to carry on seeing the series and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And for now, that'll be it. If you like this, please subscribe, share, like and all that jazz. And I'll see you very soon with the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.